Hello guys, Nigel here with you again and today we're going to be looking at getting this diff together. Now, <clears throat> in my previous uh, video we talked about the unboxing, I showed you the boxing of the Ashcroft ATB diff, which I'm using in my front diff, you can use the front or rear, um, or both. And um, one of the comments that came below that video was, you know, would I be doing a sort of thorough explanation kind of thing about how it all goes together. So I thought what I'd do is sort of start from scratch and then go through, you know, just quickly go through the stripping of the diff, which I've already done, obviously, um, what you need to check, what you need to be looking for, and then basically going for rebuilding it. And we'll start off with the pinion and everything, and then we'll look at the pattern and blah, 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 blah. So um, let's get to the bench and I'll show you where to start and what you need to be looking for. Right, so here we are at the bench, and as you can see, my diff is removed from the axle, obviously, clean, painted, everything. So, if you're doing this, um, if you're doing this and you're sort of fairly new to it and you, you want to just have a go, there's no reason why you shouldn't have a go. You, you, you can't really go wrong if you follow the manual and you follow some instructions, you watch my videos, you watch Trader Fitter Toolboxes videos, you, you know, you, you can... It's not beyond the realms of man. It's all simple bolt together stuff. There's no real need of any special tools except for one for the bearing caps, but you can always get around that. Um, so basically what you've got is your, your diff on your axle. Now with the rear axle, it's simple. You're gonna unbolt your drive flanges on the outside of the wheels, pull your half shafts out, undo the ring of bolts around your diff here, pull the diff out, job done. With the front diff, um, getting the half shafts out is a lot more complex and I'll be covering that when I rebuild the axle, you can just do it in reverse. But um, let's just imagine for a minute, you've got your diff out, it's on the bench, filthy dirty, caked in mud and shit and God knows what. Um, so you're gonna take it apart because you wanna put an Ashcroft diff in there, or you might just wanna refurbish what you've already got. So what you're basically gonna have on your bench is your diff with everything in it. Now, the first thing to do is remove your crown wheel and pinion. So you have your bearing caps here, Okay, and then these these have got a, a pin in them, a split pin, which goes into slots in the in the um, in the ring that holds the bearings in. That ring goes in there in a thread, and that's going to hold the bearings in. So you can't really knock that up very easily. So what I do is just take the bearing caps off with everything all done up. But the first thing you need to do is mark them. Now you can see on this one, you can see here if you look closely, I've got two dots there. I don't know if you can catch it in the light, there you go. You can see those two dots. And then I've got two dots here on the diff. I'm not sure you can see that, but there's two marks there on the diff. And that shows me that this one goes there. Because when they assemble the diff in the factory, they don't actually mark anything. So you need to make sure that you mark it yourself with a filed line, filed line, or a, a two cut the punch marks or whatever. You could just punch one mark in one, and then the other one has no marks. But I like to do one and two just so I know. And then um, Take those bolts out, it's just four bolts, they're not particularly tight, take them out. And then you need an um, 18 millimeter socket for them, or if you're older diff, it's gonna be, one of the problems with Land Rovers, as time's gone on, they've gone from Imperial to metric somewhere. <laughs> so like with this one, basically, you've now got a, a metric bolt holding the pinion flange on, um, whereas it used to be an Imperial nut. Um, you've now got metric bolts holding the bearing caps on, but the actual bolts that hold the ring gear onto the diff, um, they're still uh, 3 8 UNF. So you've got a mixture. So you're going to need Imperial and metric sockets if you're working on your Land Rover. And one thing to note what I think of it, there are two tapped holes on the bottom of the diff here, which are dead handy for putting in a vise. So you can hold the diff like this and work on it, like that. Um, they're not metric, they're not UNF, they're BSF, they're 3 8 BSF. Um, they may be Whitworth, but I think they're 3.8 BSF. Uh, so make sure that you've got some 3.8 BSF bolts, or you've got the original bolts that came in the bracket from the front diff. So then you can clamp that in a vise between the jaws here, and then you can work on the diff then in its normal position. Okay, so that's that covered. Sorry guys, I had to pause then because of the bin men. They, they, they do a great job, but unfortunately they seem to make, they're the only people I know that can make about 150 decibels of noise with a piece of cardboard. But anyway, um, so that's that. So you've got your crime wheel out now. That's all out. And then you're going to see it all go back together so you'll know what I'm talking about. So that's that. And then you're going to have your pinion in here. Now this is your pinion here with its bearing. Okay. And if you are doing both your diffs together, make a note of the number on the end of here. This one 
it says E222 if you look you see E222 on there make a note of it write it down I've got it written down on my cupboard doors up here so that you know which is front and rear and you don't want to be getting them all mixed up you you can if you want to do a complete and utter reshim but it's best to put the the parts back in now if your diff is in good condition it's not leaking oil it's not making loads of noise um, there's no sort of bits of swarf in the oil or anything like that or it's fairly new been recently rebuilt whatever then you may not want to bother taking the pinion out but if you have got an oil leak which is probably Land Rover's most common point of oil leaks is this area here uh, mine was leaking here on the rear diff not on the front and what had actually happened on mine this area here where, where it's painted red because can you make sure you can see it this area here that's painted red this is where the seal goes and it sits down in there I think it's five or six millimeters I can't remember now um, but that seal sits down in there now on mine this is water it's not painted and water had got under there and corroded the actual casing and it actually pushed the seal away from the casing so it made the seal wear because it pushed the seal out around but it actually the oil was leaking here not from the actual seal itself so there's no damage whatsoever because you're looking for damage on here if you've got a groove around here you need to replace it um, or you can just put the seal in a different position so it's rubbing on a different part but um I would recommend replacing it for what they cost and um so that was the, the problem I had there so don't be too sort of you know gung-ho about it if you have got an oil leak there don't think it's the seal and that's gone and everything it may just be rust in there and what I would recommend then is taking the pinion out um, and you know rather than just trying to replace the seal take the pinion out and get in there I, I was able to sandblast this I actually made an aluminium bung that went in there and I was actually able to sandblast all the corrosion away and then it's had a coat of Coralus red oxide primer as you can see or the Coralus red primer um, so that should keep the rust at bay and what I'll do is I'll put some sealant on the outside of the seal and that should keep the water out but um, that was very badly corroded in there on the on the rear diff not so much the front but um, yeah very bad so as I say if you're different pinion you haven't got an oil leak so if everything's all fine I would just leave it alone don't bother taking your pinion out <clears throat> if you do want to check it then you can take it out and you can um, and you can check everything now when you're looking at your bearings um, look at the bearing races which are in your diff and make sure they don't have any um, sort of nicks or marks in them you'd expect to see like a sort of brushed finish where the bearings been going round you don't expect to see nicks and chips in them and stuff if you look back about two or three videos ago when I actually put all this together I showed you in there what you're looking for so go back to that one and have a look um, so with this one basically I've started putting it back together now for the reassembly of these diffs here's the tools you're going to need first we're going to need a torque wrench um, and the bolts are 60 watts it depends where you're looking at the manual that you can download online for this for the Land Rover the actual genuine manual is all full um, it just it, it contradicts itself all over the place one page it says 58 newton meters for the um, actual um, crown wheel to pinion to diff carrier bolts another page it says 60 so you know, it depends what you want to look at um, so you've got the actual bearing bolts here these are 90 newton meters you've got the pinion bolt here now if you have got a bolt here it's 100 newton meters but I think if it's a nut I think it's 120 but check your check your figures don't, don't rely on anything I say because I don't want to be taken to court <laughs> so um, so there you go another example where there's an error in the manual when it comes to doing your pinion torque the manual says three to four point five pounds feet of torque to turn the pinion well that's an absolute lie because if you look in the Land Rover manual of old uh, and the Rover discs haven't changed the actual torque is 1.5 for used bearings and three Newton meters for new bearings and one Newton meter is about 0.7 pounds feet so one, you're looking at sort of 1.1 to 2.2 um, pounds feet to actually torque to actually turn that pinion so you know be very very careful with the Land Rover manual that you can download online it's a genuine Land Rover manual I believe but it's awful it is awful if you look at the interior part um, interior section of it it goes off into air conditioning and it starts to talk about a Range Rover dash it shows pictures of a Range Rover dashboard it's unbelievable it's just absolute crap so uh, be very very careful but it is free so 
all I use it for is the diagrams. So anyway, um, so there we go, we've got our diff then, it's all stripped, so then if I were to give it a good wash, give it a sandblast, whatever, paint it, and then I actually washed this out in the shower, I took a lid off a plastic container, put it in the bottom of the shower, and actually washed these with hot soap and water in the shower to make sure I got all the grit and muck and everything out of them, and um, you know, that's, that's, so we know it's all clean now. So yeah, I was going to start talking about tools, wasn't I? So, torque wrench, okay. Then this tool here, this is something I've made up, but this is basically just um, a piece of steel bar with another piece of bar on it. And this is used to go into the holes here, if I just get this apart. That goes in there, like so. And then that'll hold that so you can tighten the nut, okay, without it all spinning. So that's what that's for. Um, and then I've just got a breaker bar here. Um, 15 millimeter and an 18 millimeter socket that should do you 15 millimeter for the pinion nut 18 millimeter for the bearing caps and then this tool here I've made the bin are coming back uh, this tool here I've made and that goes in to drive that that nut as you can see there okay now if you don't have one of these you can use an ordinary pin spanner if you've got one it's just um, like a spanner with two feet and it's like a big version of what you get to do your uh, grinder up so I'm going to pause because of the noise. Okay, that's eco-friendly, but today we seem to have had one lorry for the glass, one lorry for the cardboard, and one lorry for the tin. So <laughs> it's a bit strange anyway. Um, so the other thing you, you're going to need is a micrometer, um, imperial or metric. I'm going to use an imperial one because it's easier to understand. I can say one thou, two thou, five thou, rather than 0 0.01 millimetres or whatever, and people do get confused, especially... Um, our friends across the pond um, and not putting them down at all. I've, I used to work for Rolls Royce as you know I'm an apprentice, time served Rolls Royce apprentice and a lot of the products that were for America the drawings were always in um, Imperial and all of the European stuff was always in metric. Um, some were in both so I'm sort of used to converting and working with both. Um, I would prefer to work with Imperial although metric is more accurate because you have less decimal places for the same amount of accuracy if you know what I mean so well, that's always good to go with um, the other thing is um, is the Americans tend not to use metric very much whereas in the UK we tend to use both so I'll use thou okay so I've, I've got a metric mic here but I'm going to use thou so there we go so that's everything we need oh, I've also got this plastic ring and that is purely when the diff is when the pinion is built when you put it all together, the bolt sits proud of this surface here. So I just have that to stand it on, so I can stand the diff on end to build it up. So that's all that plastic ring is for. And that is basically it. There's, there's not a lot to it, really. Um, you will see a lot of people talk about setting up and everything. Oh, you need a clock as well. You need a clock, um, which I'll cover when we get there. Um, you'll see people talking about setting up the diff and everything. I've built a few diffs in my time and I have never actually bothered with measuring equipment to set the pinion height and everything what I've always done is used the original shims that came out because even if these bearings on your pin if this bearing on here is absolutely sharp you know the chances are when it was originally put together it would have been okay so fit new bearings use the original shims and go from there. That's the best advice I can give you. Don't worry about trying to set your depth and everything from scratch. Um, if you've got a new casing with nothing in it, then just get a sort of nominal two millimeter shim. So basically in here, we've got a bearing inside here and underneath that bearing is a shim. Okay, and the shim on this one, this is the front. I did write it down, it is 2.12 millimeters. There we go, so straight away I was gonna go into thou and straight away I'm talking about millimeters. So yeah, it's 2.12 millimetres, that shim. Um, if you want to buy them from Land Rover, you can, but I would suggest getting the Ashcroft diff shim kit because it's like £28 for all the shims you could ever need. Whereas if you go to Rover, these are like 20 odd pounds each. So if you decided that you say, you like me, you've got a 2.12 and you want one at 2 mil, you go and buy a 2 mil shim, it's £26. Then you discover you actually wanted a 2.05, that's another £26. You may as well get the diff shim kit from um, from Dave Ashcroft, Ashcroft Transmissions, and then you can chop and change as you go. So that's what I've got, and that's what I'm going to be doing. 
So this one I've actually taken apart again. I have actually built it once and all was good. If anything, the preload on the pinion was a little light. Right, so now we're gonna look at assembling it. So I've got my pinion here. It's all been washed in paraffin, all been checked. Bearing's got no scoring, no chips, no missing rollers, nothing like that. The, the bearing race is absolutely fine. All the teeth on here are good. Everything's looking lovely. So we're good to go. So I'm just gonna put a drop of oil on here. I don't believe it, another bin lorry has just gone by, so that's four now. Oh well, so that's going to go in there. So I've got some oil on there, that's just going to drop in there, like so. Okay, and you can hear that the it's hitting the end of there. So we can stand this on our block of ring of plastic, and we can just turn that in there, and then just get everything running nice and smoothly. Okay, so then I'm going to turn the diff over on its side. Now there's a shim. So we've got the first shim in there, which is actually setting our position of our pinion. Now the next shim is actually gonna set, in fact, I'll show you one here. The next shim is gonna set the bearing preload. So in here, we've got an inner and outer bearing. And then we've got a shim that goes on here. And then we've got the bearing going on there. So when you clamp this up, it's basically that's gonna slide over and clamp onto there. So you're clamping this up with your 100 newton meters of force, which is actually gonna push this bearing center into here, okay? And it's gonna clamp everything up good and tight. So what you're doing is pulling this bearing and this bearing together, and that shim is giving you a preload, and your preload you want, as I say, which I'll show you in a minute, is 1.1 to 2.2 pounds feet. Now, the Land Rover Genuine Manual recommends 1.5 newton meters for used bearings, so that's going to be around around 1, 1.1, 1 1.2 pounds feet. Okay, so um, so that's basically that. So that shim there is what is going to set your preload. So basically, that shim there goes on that bearing. That's going to go into there like that. We're going to slide the shim over like so. In fact, I'll lift this up so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, and then I'm going to put that bearing in there, just like that, and then with my hand underneath I can hold that up, put this over the top, drop that down on. I'm going to give it a gentle tap because the bottoms of the splines are a little tight on this one. Put the bolt in. Okay, and that will hold everything in place. So I've got the diff stood there now. So with this tool, I can hold the flange in place. Get my 15 millimeter socket on there. Get my breaker bar into the socket. And just pull everything down. You see it's not very tight at all. It's just that last little bit of spline on mine just drags a touch. There we go. So what I would suggest you do is just nip it and feel it. Okay, you, you can hear the noise, that's because the bearing's basically pretty much dry. Okay, so there we go. Now, I just feel straight away that's feeling quite good. I think it's actually a little bit too loose. So, we're going to torque this to 100 newton meters. So, I've already got the torque wrench set to 100 newton meters. So, I'll put my bar in here. Get my torque wrench on there. Hundred newton meters. And we can feel that. Okay. So now I want to just check the preload on that bearing. So I'm going to get my 15 millimeter socket and my bar. Now pounds feet is all about weight over a distance. So a foot along this bar. I'll grab my six inch rule. That's about a foot there. Okay. So I can use my good old scales again, which I used if you saw my swivel rebuild. Okay, I've got this set on pounds. So what we should see is around about one pound once it starts moving. So I'll get it back here. And then what I've actually got there, you can see it's frozen and we've got 0.5 roughly 
So I want to go about a thousand thinner if I can. Um, so I'm going to go and grab my shim kit from um, Dave Ashcroft, measure up this shim, and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay, so now I've got this shim out, and it is an Imperial. It is. Somebody's now decided to start hitting things with a hammer. It is 76 thou. Okay, so if you can read on my chromatic, you can see on there 76 thou. Okay, so what we'll do, in fact, I'll do the metric as well, just so that everybody's happy. I'll clean my mic first. Always clean your mic first on a piece of paper or a piece of card or something. Just nip it up and then pull it off just to wipe the anvils clean. Check it's reading zero. Yep. And then, yeah, in metric, we can see that is 1.93. Okay, 1.93 millimeters. Right, so. I've just had a thought, I've just looked at my uh, board where I've written down my shim thicknesses and I noticed that the actual shim for the rear diff was 1.91. So we can see on here with the metric mic, we've got 1.91, which is an Imperial 75,000. So we've got a thou difference. So we can try this shim actually on here. So. We'll put that one over the pinion. And I'm just going to put a little bit of oil because I just realised I didn't put any oil on it last time. It had some residual oil from uh, when I've done this before because remember I've done this same thing a couple of weeks ago. So um, just tip this up, get my fingers under the pinion, push the pinion up through the pinion flange on. Come on, there you want to, there we go, and then just do the bolt up again. And as I say, I'm just going to nip this and then check. Because what you don't want to do is just jump straight into torquing it down because if you're a mile out you could damage your bearing. So that's just nipped. Okay, and I can feel that it's, it's got some resistance there. It feels more like what we should have. So we'll take the socket off the breaker bar, get the socket on the torque wrench, get that in there, 100 newton meters. There we go. There you go and as you can feel it takes it takes a bit to get it moving because it's kind of locked up but you're looking at the actual torque to turn it so I should have got two 15 mil sockets that shouldn't I really so we'll put that in there okay and we'll grab our scales actually I'm just going to spin this just to seat it down a bit I've got a feeling this is too tight Okay, so we've, we're in pounds. So I'm just going to drag this over. I've got 1.1 pounds torque on there. So that sounds, seems pretty good. Um, it feels pretty good. But you do have to overcome that original, that initial jam to get it going so 1.1 let's just take that again and you know, I'm getting 1.4 now so it's kind of I need to be halfway between the two um, and you can't get there so I'm looking for half a thou difference so what I might do is see if I can make a stack up of the 
Ashcroft shims and see where we go from there. Okay, so this is the shim kit from Ashcroft Transmissions, £28, and it's absolute bargain when you consider that the genuine Land Rover ones are like £26 each. And you're getting all those in there for the for your um, pinion height, and you're getting all these in here for your preload, and they're going from sort of, um, what have we got here? The thickest one, <coughs> the thickest one I'm going to use, which is... I think it's 74 thou. Yeah, 74 thou. And the thinnest one is about one and a half, two thou. So this stack here is giving me 75 and a half thou, kind of. So we may actually get there when it's all clamped down. It may be a bit tight, but um, I'm not sort of happy with the with the 76 thou, was it? I'm sort of, it's really loose. And with the 75 though, it's, as you know, it's that really tight. I might go a little, I don't know. The trouble is these bearings are already run, so they're already bedded in. And I don't really want to push them any further. The other thing, of course, is making a lot of fuss with this now, okay, is not really worth the effort of going to the last sort of half a thou, whatever, until you've set your pinion height. Because if we do all this now and get this perfect, when we turn it over, if we have to adjust the pinion height, we change the shim in here to move this bearing, then obviously this shim in here is going to change the suit. So, you know, it's kind of um, a bit of a waste of time if you don't know your pinion height is okay. Now, I've already done this once, and I know my pinion height is okay. Well, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's okay. Obviously, we're going to measure it, we're going to check it, and I'll show you how to do that. I've noticed I've just had a message from Simon asking if I use the expensive tooling, or is there another way? Um, there is another way. It just depends what you're starting with, as I said in the beginning of the video. So I'm going to get this apart now, put these shims in, and see what it's like. Okay, so after about an hour of messing around with different shims from the Ashcroft shim kit, and going back to the original two Rover shims I had, I've ended up going back to where I was with the um, 1.93 millimeter shim, which was 76 thou, I think 77 thou. Um, if I go even half a thou, I'm, I'm, I'm able to get to about 75 and a half thou with the, um, with the Ashcroft shims. Trouble is when you use multiple shims, I think they always do compress a few microns. But um, even then it was still too tight. I didn't like it. It was kind of biting and then it would move. So it's definitely got some preload because I can feel friction there and it does kind of stick when you stop it. But it only just sticks. Whereas if I go for the thou less, it kind of... You know, you have to really sort of break it away. So, you know, at the end of the day, if it's if it's slightly loose, I don't think it's going to hurt as long as it's got some preload. And bearing in mind, these, bearing in mind, <laughs> God, get, I can't get over myself. Um, yeah, bearing in mind, these bearings are used, so they've already worn in. So um, if they were brand new, I would, I would be happy with going with the tighter load. But as they're already bedded in, I don't want to start causing overheating and having them breaking up and stuff. That's uh, that's not good at all. So we're going to leave that as it is. It's all torqued up, ready to go. Now, obviously, we have the seal to go in there, but don't fit the seal yet because, as I say, we may turn it over and find we have to adjust the pinion height, which means what I've just done is a complete waste of time, but we need to do it anyway. Um, but also, um, the seal will affect how everything feels that the seal it's the same as when you do swivels when you're doing your swivel um pull if you do it with the seals on it affects all the, the pull and everything so um anyway ready to turn the diff over so got a plastic ring here like i said so we pick the diff up turn it over and you can see that if we stand it on the bench it rocks about because that bolt sits proud so we've got a plastic ring just stand it on the plastic ring and there we go it sits nice and solid now so there we go, everything's, uh, everything's good. So uh, we're ready to start putting the diff together. Now the first thing we need to do is get our crown wheel and fix it onto our new um, Ashcroft ATB diff. So we can get this out of the way, slide that over there, out of the way, and then we can make sure the clean hands, your hands are the best cleaning product there is for removing dust and grit and dirt. Okay, so got everything there, ready to go. So um, let's get our ring gear and uh, bolts. The bolts are in here, in the solvent. So we need to get them out and let them dry off. Now it's imperative these bolts are cleaned off because they have a tendency to come loose. I'm led to believe by the forums. So I want to sort of 
make sure that I get get thread lock on there and give it as good a chance as it's possibly got. So the ring gear has been cleaned in solvent. The bolts have now been cleaned in solvent and the um, threads in the in the Ashcroft locker or Ashcroft ATB diff will also be cleaned out with solvent. So we'll make sure everything's clean. Um, and this way we can clean the threads and you'll see that when the solvent evaporates everything will be nice and dry. And that's basically just a xylene I've been soaking them in. It's nothing particularly special. I shouldn't really be getting it on my fingers but hey ho. So I'll clean all these off then I'll get the ring gear and we'll go from there. Okay, so we've got our Ashcroft ATV. I've got the ring gear here, which I removed the other night, and I did a video on that. The only thing I've done, I've washed this out in solvent. I've run a tap through all the threads, they're 3 8 BSF, uh, sorry, 3 8 UNF, they're 3 8 UNF, um, and I've stoned the back face. And something I noticed when I stoned it, you, can, you may be able to pick up here. That's where it was stoned the most on all of them, and this is where the thinnest section of steel is, and it's kind of, when it torques, it may actually just pull just, you know, we're talking microns, it may just pull this area. So when I stoned it, I've stoned it flat. Um, and I'm tempted to kind of undercut those areas a touch. With, and I mean, we're talking a couple of microns with stone. And I'm wondering if this is why they come loose. Because if when it's torqued up, it pulls that area hard into the face of the diff, this area here is, and we're talking microns here, less, probably sub-micron, it's able to flutter and that could enable the bulk to come loose. So... I don't know, maybe I'm onto something, but you can see here, particularly on this one, you can see there's some heavy marking. You've got the turning marks of the diff in there. So it's just worth giving it a stone off. So I'm going to give it a stone again. Um, where is my stone? Here it is. This is an old sharpening stone, but it's um, it's big and it's flat. And it doesn't really matter if it's not perfectly flat because we're going to do it in circular motions. Use the coarse side as well. And you'll know when it's done because you won't feel any resistance. When, when you're stoning something, if you can feel it sort of tight in areas, then it means it's doing some work. When it's done its work and everything's flat, it just sort of glides over there as if it's another sheet of metal or something on there. So that's all good. So now what we need to do is blow those threads out. So I'll blow the threads out now. I'll do it off camera because the dog will go mental when I get the airline out. And um, and they're already cleaned out with solvent and everything, so uh, we're good to go. So happy with that. Um, and then we'll get the diff out, I'll get it in the vise, and we'll go from there. Right, so I've got some um, 3 8 UNF. Where's my hand? Here we go. 3 8 UNF manifold studs here. And what I'm going to do is screw these into my ring gear. Or crown wheel, if you like. And then I'm going to use these, hopefully, to pull the uh, ring gear kind of onto the diff. Now, this has been in the house, so it's nice and warm. Now, I'm just going to put a couple of nuts on here. Right, so we've got the diff here in the bag. So the first thing I'll do is get it out of the bag and mark the bearings. Because, as I mentioned in the unboxing video, this one comes with bearings at an extra cost. Um, the, the locker comes with bearings anyway. What was that? What just made a noise? I was locking those bolts over. I thought something fell out of the diff then. Oh my god, here we go. So um, what I need to do is mark these bearings up. So I'm going to mark them the same as they are on the diff here. So we've got this, the, the, the crown wheel side is one and this side is two. So if we mark these up the same. So this one can be number two okay and then this one can be number one and make sure we don't touch those mark them in two places because obviously there's oil on there and the pen will rub off so um what we need to do now is get our crown wheel onto the diff like so and as i say i've got these studs because when you pull it on, I'm wondering 
things that only goes one way. The other thing I need to do is make sure this face is absolutely spotlessly clean. So again, lint-free rag. In fact, I'm going to grab some brake cleaner. There we go. Not the cheap stuff, the good stuff. Give that another go over as well. Just make sure this face is spotless. It's a beautifully produced item. There's no burrs on it, there's no raggedy edges, nothing. We just wipe the ring gear off, make sure there's nothing on that face. And then again, your hands, your fingers, whatever, the, your skin is the best thing there is for cleaning this surface. There we go. So this should now drop on. I'm thinking it's gone anyway. It's 10 bolts. But for some reason, either these studs aren't straight. But something is stopping this going in. So I can only think these studs aren't straight. So we'll take one out. idea after all. Let's leave one in. Okay so that's gone on like so. So making sure we keep it square. Make sure the mallet face is clean. going to turn it over and I'm going to degrease these faces to spray some on the rag and then wipe the rag around. I should have done this before I um, before I put the ring gear on. But basically now what that dowel's done enabled me to make sure that it's central. So I'm just going to check with a couple of bolts. I want to make sure the bolts go in freely. It's no good if they're going to rub down the sides. They should just screw in with your fingers. There we go. So they've, they're in like that. So I know that's all good. So we can turn over now and just tap it. Of course, the other thing you could do is put the ring gear in the oven, warm it up. A bit, not too much. I could do with a more solid bench, to be quite honest with you. There we go. So that's that down. Yeah, happy with that. So I'll take that stud out and then. Um, I'll just put the bolts in and just nip them just to make sure it's all down and then we'll get it in the vise and torque them up. Right, so we've got one sat in the vise now all clamped up nice and tight. Um, what I've done, I've gone round and put the bolts in uh, with no thread lock or anything. Just go around and diagonally nip them up just to make sure that the actual um, crown wheel is pulled nice and snug against the face. So now I can go around and just remove all these bolts and then we can get some thread lock on them and then we'll go from there.
Okay, so I'm going to use Loctite 243 for my thread lock. There are stronger thread locks out there. I can't remember the number now, but there's a green liquid one. Uh, it's not 638. 638 would be awful. But I have seen, I, well, I've, I've used them in the past, and I've found that when I've come to undo the bolts, they can actually damage the threads. They're that good that they're so hard that as they wind the thread out, especially in castings, it will actually damage the thread. So be very, very careful. I'm going to use this because I know it's quite kind. So all we need is a small drop. Just a, all I ever do is just a, a line, like so. Nothing too much. I think I need to get a new bottle. Right, so we get these torqued down now, 60 newton meters, and they're 9 sixteenths, they're not 14 millimeters. So uh, just bear that in mind. So we're gonna do these in a diagonal pattern. I'm just checking I've got my torque wrench set to 60 newton meters, and I'm hoping the vise is gonna hold it. Yes. So there's two. We'll go to that one. Three. Four. We'll go to that one. Five. Six. Get to that one. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. And it's always worth counting when you do it to make sure you get them all. If you don't get to ten, then you know you haven't done them all. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. There we go. So that's our crown wheel on. It just doesn't feel tight enough to me. It feels like I want to really pull them down. But uh, that's what the spec says, so that's what it shall be. Um, so there we go. Right, we've got to look at getting this in the actual diff carrier now. Okay, so this is still in the vice. Uh, I've got my bearings here. So we've got um, one which is going on that side. Okay, and we've got two. Which is, sorry, this is one, and this is two going on this side. Okay, so we've got the one spot there, but the two spots there, so I know the bearings are on the right sides. And then the disc just going to drop down in there. So take the Ashcroft ATB out of the vice, which is no mean feat because it weighs a ton. And that bearing is going to sit in that side. These bearings are pre oiled, so I'm not going to worry about putting any more lubrication on them. Excuse the seagulls. And then we're just going to drop this. Oops, he says we're going to drop this down in here without dislodging the bearings. I'm just going to drop that down in there, like so, in some kind of fashion. I'm just going to lift that side up and push that bearing in. There we go. And the same on that side. There we are. And that is now sat in there like that now be careful here because if anything's out of square you could start causing damage you want to make sure that everything is nice and seated okay so that bearing is okay seated. so sorry about that the um the memory went on the uh, camera phone shall i say so uh, while i was doing that and um, the other thing i've just thought of i haven't talked about setting the pinion height um i covered that in the video i did on the 19th of March, uh, diffs and bushes, I think it's called. And um, you can see in there, now when I come to do the rear diff, obviously I'll do a, a, an install again. Um, won't go into too much detail that I've already covered here. But basically I will cover um, what I've already seen and, and what you've already seen on the rear diff because the rear diff needs adjustment. And the reason is, the thing is you can set your pinion as good as you like. And then when you come to do your pattern on your gear here, okay, you may find you need to adjust it. So it's really pointless spending hours and hours and hours fussing around with special tools to get your pinion absolutely perfect, because you you may well find you have to adjust it when you get it in anyway. So um, what I did with this one, I measured them from here to the front of the pinion face, wrote the dimension down before I stripped them down. And then when I went back together, I made sure they're the same. So they are the same, and even though they're the same, the front one, the pattern's perfect, but the rear was uh, was out. So 
I'm going to be playing with shims and stuff and I will do a video on that on how I get the get the pattern right and which way I go to get the pattern right but basically instead of using jigs and, and fixtures and clocks and everything I'm going to be using the pattern to set because at the end of the day it's the pattern that needs to be right the pinion height is what's giving you the pattern the pattern is a result of pinion height so if your pinion height spot on to where you want it where the manual says and your pattern's wrong you're going to change it anyway so at the end of the day don't worry about buying expensive blocks and stuff so um there we go so now we can just slot these rings in now we've got, i've got these rings numbered as well so this is number one going in this side okay make sure you don't get them cross threaded so that's just going to go in there like so okay make sure you don't get them cross threaded and then just drop them in okay and that's in like that now so now you can come along with your bearings your bearing caps should i say and this one is number two so this one's going to go on this side and there's dowels on the bottom here make sure they're in place make sure your faces are clean i've already done all that on this one okay so make sure your ring turns freely in there and then just drop the cap on again we're not hitting anything we're not clamping anything down we're just literally using hand pressure to get everything together because that way we won't damage anything Okay, now I'm not 100% happy with how that's gone. So we're going to wind this out. And this is the whole reason, guys, for using hand pressure. There we go, now I'm happy with that now. That's much better. You see, so I almost had it cross threaded. I could have started hitting things and pulling things down with bolts and all sorts. Come on to this side, you can still do the same here. It's difficult to do this so you can see what I'm doing without my bloody hands in the way. So just get that to go down in. It doesn't want to go in for some reason. And it's not the ring that's stopping it. That's right, Jess is telling us the same. So I'm going to take that ring out. Get those dowels lined up. And then I should be able to wind that ring in. There we go. If you watch my other video, <laughs> it went a lot smoother than this. Yeah, on the other video, I managed to put those rings in and just drop it all together. I don't know why. It's nothing to do with the diff. It's just the um, with the Ashcroft diff. I mean, it's just luck of the draw, I think. It's also the fact the camera's on doesn't help. So I'm gonna do this one up on the left to push the, so I've got no backlash there at the moment. So I'm gonna undo this one, push this one over. So I'm not, what you wanna do is make sure you're not doing anything up and pushing. If you, if you're, if you do this one up, you're gonna push the crime wheel into the pinion. You need to make sure that you've got that one done up. So you're pushing against the bearing and then this one can push against. So we've got loads of backlash, so we're holding the diff in place with loads of backlash, and that's what we want. So um, first thing to do, get these bolts in. And initially I'm just gonna nip them down. I'm not gonna do them very tight at all. mil socket I think the manual says don't to 10 newton meters but I think that's just a, a sort of plucked out of the sky figure it's just to make sure they're down really and you don't want to be pulling them down tight because then you won't be able to turn the, the threaded rings okay so we've got loads of backlash okay so we're all good there so everything's in place. Now the first thing I want to do is check the run out. So um, to do the run out, I need to be able to spin it. So I'm going to have to put it in the vise. So I'm going to use these two bolts to hold it in the vise. And I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so the diff's in the vise now. Basically, those two bolts are clamped down in the jaws down in here. 
and that holds it nice and secure. The movement you can see is the fact that my vice isn't very solid on the bench. So I need to get a new bench, really. Um, so anyway, this is um, this is the diff here held in the vice. So now we can spin this freely. As you can see, I've got loads of backlash in there. That's done on purpose. As I say, winding these nuts, you could easily be launching them in and, and launching the pinion and crown wheel together. You don't want to be doing that. So make sure you've got backlash and then you know that you're just holding the, the bearings of the diff in limbo and you're not putting anything under any undue stress. Now I said I made this tool for doing that. It's just basically three holes and then that goes in there and you can turn it. But you could actually use a pin spanner. You could, you could even just tap them round with a brass drift. Um, at the end of the day, it's not rocket science because, you know, you're going to set everything lovely and then you've got to adjust it to get these pins in because, you know, you've only got that much movement. So um, it does say in the manual, I can't remember now, I must check, it says never loosen it. I think it says always tighten it to get the pin to line up. Um, so the first one to do is clock it, clock the run out. Now, a lot of people you'll see on YouTube use these kind of things. Okay, and this is called a, a mag block with a monkey. These are called monkeys. And uh, because they climb up, like the monkey climbs up a tree, I guess. But these things are so big and heavy and cumbersome and they're always awkward to use, especially the cheap Chinese crap like this. Um, so what I always do is use this. And this is a tiny little mag block with what's called a verdict lock or a finger clock. Finger clock. So this is much easier to use. You can see you just plop this on there like that. And you, if you want to check your backlash, you can just plop that on there like so. Get the finger down in there. And then you can check your backlash just like that, rather than having to use that great big cumbersome thing. And the same for the run out, I can put this on here, okay, and I can put the clock on the on the side and just measure the run out without having to um, worry about a great big clambering block or anything. Okay, so I'm going to put that on there. And this is how we measure the run out on the back face. And the run out on here is... The spec is one to three thou, and this one is actually running at, blimey, I don't think it's hardly moving. Oh, come on. All my equipment is old and worn and seen better days. Of course, I don't have a workshop, I just have the garage where everything sits out in the winter, all gets damp and everything. Okay, so there we are, we're on zero. Yeah, it's, it's less than a thou, so I'm really happy with that. Um, so the run out's great. That means Ashcroft have done an awesome job of getting the perpendicularity of the crown wheel face to the spindle. Absolutely spot on. That's awesome. So now we're going to do the backlash. Now the backlash is how we're going to set the bearings. So what I'm going to do is put the clock in here. Again, I've covered all this in my last video. So I'm going to put the clock in here. Okay, and I'm going to measure the backlash. So I'm going to come up to the Okay, so I'll come up to the tooth there. There we go. Now we've got lots and lots of backlash. So I need to get rid of that. So what we're going to do is wind this bearing out. Okay, so we can come in here. Put the tool in there. I'm going to wind this one out like so and then wind this one in like so. Still got backlash and if you notice I'm not actually graunching anything I'm just using the spanner right up the head. I don't want to be putting any undue stress on anything. So we've still got way too much backlash. They tell you in the manual to do this up to 16 pounds feet, and that should be about it. Well, I, I don't think that's really a fantastic way to do it. Okay, so that's uh, what's that now? That's about 10 thou. I think it's three to seven thou the backlash. Just check. Yeah, the backlash is three to seven thou. So, so that's that's 
it's about three thou so we just wind this one up just to nip it up these bearings have to have a bit of preload on them as well yeah that's four thou four thou backlash on there I'll just check this side is ripped up as well Okay, so that's our backlash set. So we've we've checked the run out, we've made sure it all spins true and everything, and then we've set our backlash. And I'll bring you around so you can see what you're looking at on the clock. Bring you around so you can see the clock there. Okay, and this is in thousands, so you can see it's going from 11, 11 down to 7 or so. Fourth hour backlash, and also make sure your clock's not on the limit. So, what I'm saying is, if if I had the clock here, you think, well, I've got no backlash, but it's because the clock's up against its stop. Make sure the clock is in in the middle of its travel, if you like, and not jammed up. You can see there, we've got it's like three and a half, four thousand. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Right. So now we need to look at the pattern. Right, so we need a sort of paste or something to, to show us the pattern. I'm going to put this on the teeth. And what I use is aluminium oxide. This is actually a white, white powder. As you can see, it's not, it's not what you think it is. And um, aluminium oxide. And mix it with a drop of oil. And then you end up with this lovely thick white paint-like product. And it's awesome. You paint it on the gears and it shows you your pattern. So let me get the camera back onto the diff. <laughs> I'm spending more time using this bloody camera than I'm doing the diff. Let me get the camera back on the diff and then I'll show you what okay. I mean. So we're nice and close now. So I can get this paint. And I'm just going to paint this onto the backs and the fronts of the gears. Okay, and then we get a nice even pattern on there. And what we're looking at is when the pinion rubs this, we will see the actual contact area. Okay, so if I just do four. This, to be honest, this could actually do with being a little bit thicker, a bit more powder than to oil. The beauty of this stuff is you can just wipe it off with a rag. It's not like paint, it's not all sticky and messy and gets everywhere. So there we go, so that's there like that. So we can, now what we can do is wind the, wind the gear onto the pinion and we're just gonna run it round a few times and make sure it goes. And I'm just gonna give the pinion a bit of resistance. So as I turn the crown wheel, I'm pulling back on the pinion so that it increases the pressure. And then we can look at the pattern that we've got. And what we can see here I just zoom you in okay what we can see here is we've got a very long pattern let me grab a pointer you can see that the pattern is not hanging off the edge here if it's coming off the edge here it's wrong it's not coming off the edge here and it's not coming off the edge here and it's not right into the root so on this side which is actually the this is the front axle, so that way is the drive. So it's this side that's actually the drive. Okay, and then this side here is the overrun. So you can see we've got a nice long pattern. Okay, very long contact area, which is really nice. It's not running off any edges. It's not running into the root. And then when we look at the other side, okay, so we can see on the back side here, that again, we've got this lovely long pattern, which is really nice. Now, what we can do now, I'm going to add some more powder and thicken up this and do it on another spot. Maybe be able to show you a bit easier. Because I know this is something that a lot of people are kind of scared of. Um, quite needlessly. All you need for this is time and patience. Um, it is a skill you can learn. It's something 
I can talk to you about this all day long till I'm blue in the face. It's something you need to learn yourself. I, I'm self-taught. Um, when I learned this, there wasn't such thing as called the internet. It was books then. And uh, yeah, research meant, like for, I built a replica Lancia race car once and it meant flying to Turin to see a real one, take photographs and measurements. And it also meant I went to Nice in France to see one that was for sale. And um, yeah, <laughs> these days you get on Google and you've got everything you could ever want. Okay, so there we go, that's just three teeth there. Okay, this is better. So on the back side now, you can see, this is on the overrun, you can see the pattern is sort of from here to here. It's not coming over this edge and it's not going into the root, so it's centered on the tooth. Okay, here to here, there to there. If it was way off here, we'd, we'd have a problem. If it was way off here, or if it was hanging off the edge, it would be a problem. And then on the drive side, move the camera around, you can see on the drive side again, We've got the same pattern as before. It's heavier here than it is up here, but you can see that it's this lively wide contact area, which is what you'd expect to see on a good condition run-in sort of diff. On a brand new one, you can see a pattern which is very small, and then what you want to do is try and keep that centered or out, not have it down here. Um, if you, you know you see a con tiny contact patch, but if you look at the Land River manuals or any sort of websites all about diffs or whatever, they all talk about it and um and the sort of what you need to do to get around it. You'll have, it's either going to be backlash moving it in and out. So you're going to move your diff. Let me just get this focused out again. You're going to move your crown wheel in or out. Or you're going to move your pinion in or out. To get the pattern right. But I'm going to leave that as it is. That is absolutely fine. Um, really pleased with how that looks. And the other thing you can do is keep going round. And what you will see is where, where it's got um, deposited... You see where it's too thin, it's, there's too much on there. And this is what will fool you because what it does, it oozes out and um, it'll pick up where it's oozed out rather than the actual contact area. But um, yeah, really happy with how that looks. Really pleased with that. So I'll give it a clean up and then we'll uh, move forward. Okay, so I just want to show you something here for reference. Um, it's quite difficult to see actually the angle we're on but basically um i've changed the backlash so the backlash is now maximized at about seven thou and you can see that the pattern has moved out towards the edge of the teeth you see here the pattern is more stronger down this edge here now this line you can see the machining marks in the actual teeth itself so you can see how little wear it's got it's still got signs of machining marks and on the other side, on the overrun side, we can see, if we can get the camera in there, we can see that, again, the pattern is right out on the edge. Okay, it's not in. So this is showing that our backlash is too high. So simply just by literally undoing this, the, the nut on the side facing you now and pushing the crown wheel in, in closer, my dexter my finger, in closer to the pinion, you can get the pattern perfected. So I'll do that now and then we'll start looking at getting it all wrapped up. Okay, so I've gone back and now reset the backlash now to about 4,000, so I'm happy with that. Uh, pattern's good, um, everything's looking good. Now if we look in the manual, I'll just show you here. Um, it's saying align adjusting nuts to next roll pin slot, do not loosen nuts to align slots. So, Basically, when you've got everything all nipped up and you're happy, you need to turn it, tighten it, to get it a slot to line up with the pin. Okay, so don't actually go loosening it. You're better off having it too tight. And as long as everything's all free to turn and all smooth, then and everything's then everything's good. Okay, so if it's tight to turn, then you've got too much preload. You need to back it off. Well, you need to back it off and start again. Don't go backing it off one of those because that's going to be too much. Um, the old ones used to have a, sh a lever that went over it. It was a much finer just, um, adjustment. This isn't so good at all. So I need to actually torque these up now, um, these caps, and they are 90 newton meters. They need to be tightened up to. So we'll set our torque wrench at 90 newton meters. It's 80, there's 90. And we'll see if we can actually uh, 
break the vice <laughs> or break the bench should I say um, if I lift it rather than push down it should make things a lot easier so we'll just come up there we go there's that one there's that one I'm conscious of ripping the thing out of the vice hitting the camera now there we go I'll just check them again there we go they're not going anywhere so that's all done so now what we need to do is grab a drift um, grab a brass one of brass and a hammer and drift these in just like so and that will stop these coming undone and there we are that's our diff rebuilt three thou backlash smooth running good pattern new bearings on the diff anyway and uh all good so um there we are that's how it's done so the next thing to do now will be to take the pinion off and fit a new seal i don't need to show you how to do that um in fact i'm not going to do that right away because i don't know how long it's going to be stood for um when, when you leave things stood with seals on the seals can actually get stuck to the shafts and rip so i won't be fitting a seal in now but i have made it actually made a ring that i can press the seal in with uh, to set it to the right depth so when i do that i will cover it and i'll probably do the front and rear together so there we are guys that's basically how you do it um give you a quick walk around there we go you can see on this side it's the same as uh, as the other side with the pin in there these done up to 90 newton meters these done up to 60 newton meters we check the run out on this face here, we check the backlash on the teeth, and then we used our aluminium oxide to get the pattern, which is really nice. Okay, so there we go guys, thanks for watching. Um, sorry if it's been a bit bitty, but uh, it's not been the easiest video to make, to be honest. And plus with all the, <laughs> all the kids screaming and shouting, playing ball, the dustbin men, the dog barking, um, plus the fat and bloody freezing cold of my knees were in. So, um, I'm going to go in now. So thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you all soon with another video. And I've had a delivery today, so I've got something else a little bit special to show you from a from a company I'd never heard of. So I'll see you all soon. Bye for now. Just quickly, guys, I just want to clarify something. I've got a feeling that during the video, I've been saying that this side of the tooth was the drive and this side was the overrun. Where am I? Here. Um, it's actually this, this side of the tooth in the back here. This is the drive. And this, what you can see here now, the front, this is the overrun. So as the, as the pinion turns this way, okay, it's driving the front wheels this way. Okay, so the pinion, as you can see down in there, the pinion is pushing the crown wheel up. So um, that's the way it's going. I'm sure I'm correct in saying that because this is the front diff and the deer, rear should be the same. So um, there we go. So just in case I got it wrong, I'm just making this to cover my back.